Is, is one of those documents. The file of, have anybody seen the file of life? I, I don't know if they've encouraged those here in Martha's Vineyard. A wonderful idea. File of life is basically a, a, a document that contains all of the important information that, you're, that the guy from the ambulance and would really want to know if they went into your house and found you on the floor. So it would contain not only, it may have the, the DNR attached to it, but it would also say, what drugs are you on? Who is your primary care physician? Just all of the basic information that you'd really want to know. So that's, that's, a, that's the file of life. Uh, finally, the five wishes. Has anybody here heard of the five wishes? You've heard of the five wishes. I am not a fan of the five wishes. Uh, the five wishes is a, was a nationally prepared document which, which has two things to it, really. When you, if you look at the document, it, the, the idea behind the document is to really give you the opportunity to talk with your kids about you know, the way in which you want to be treated in the event that you're incapacitated and, and you can't make that decision. Um, um, and, then to, and then to put those feelings down so you feel like you're going to be treated that way. The problem with it is that it tries to be two things at once. It also is, in, in its typical form, a healthcare proxy. As part of the five wishes, you are naming the person who is supposedly making these medical decisions for you. Typically, it is witnessed by two people, and, and if it is, then in Massachusetts, it operates as a healthcare proxy. So legally, then, what the five wishes is, it's a healthcare proxy together with a set of instructions which may or may not be limiting the power of the person with the healthcare proxy. Because remember when we talked about proxies earlier, we said, when you're doing a healthcare proxy, it has to be signed by two witnesses and you have the power to limit the powers of the proxy. Mm -hmm. So what the five wishes can end up doing for you is confusing your doctor. Because you're now you're in the hospital and, the, and your proxy is there. And remember, the five wishes are no good without the healthcare proxy, right? Because if, if the five wishes, unless there's a healthcare proxy there, what the five wishes are regarding how you're going to get treated is an advanced directive. And as we spoke, spoke about, advanced directives are not enforceable in Massachusetts, right? So if it's not a healthcare proxy, it's nothing. If it is a healthcare proxy, well, then it's like kind of a confusing healthcare proxy because you're saying, I'm giving so and so the power to make my healthcare decisions for me, but don't forget to read all of the other things that I put in here because I may have limited his powers somehow. That's why I'm not comfortable with the five wishes. Now, once again, I've spoken to other lawyers who disagree with me on that, but this is the kind of, so I'm just kind of explaining to you the rationale for that. Next slide. Um, one other thing. There, as an alternative, going back to control over your property, as an alternative to basically keeping all of your property in your own name uh, and then naming a power of attorney who can act on your behalf in the event that you are incapacitated. Uh, what some folks do, and I'm gonna, just going to talk to you about that for a few minutes, is to create a revocable trust. What is a trust? Uh, a trust is a relationship between two kinds of people. A trustee, who is the person who has legal ownership of property and has the right to deal with that property, as far as the rest of the world is concerned, and a beneficiary. The trustee is holding property always for the benefit of the beneficiary. Uh, a trustee it can be a, one of the beneficiaries. You just can't have a trust in which the trustee is the only beneficiary because if you're the trustee and the beneficiary and there's nobody else, well, then there's no trust. There's just you. That means that you just simply own the property. When you own things, basically, that's what you have. You have the legal ownership and you have this beneficial ownership. So um, when you have a, you, what you can do is you can name yourself as a trustee for the benefit of some others and then so thereby keeping control of the property. But, in, but then naming a successor trustee who's going to take charge on your behalf in the event that you're incapacitated. 
The most common one that you deal with um, is a Totten Trust, which you've probably never heard of, but that's what you're doing really. When you go to the bank and you set up a bank account that isn't just in your name, and then suppose you want to set up a bank account that says, well, I want to have control of this account as long as I'm alive, but if I die, I want my daughter to get the money, or I want my son to get the money. And you can create such a bank account. What that is is a Totten Trust. Uh, Totten was the name of the first guy that did one of these. So, so um, what, what a revocable trust is, is a trust in which you're naming yourself as the trustee for the benefit of yourself and maybe some other beneficiaries. Um, and, and, what, and so what about what are revocable trusts versus power of attorney? Um, first of all, revo revo creating a revocable trust and putting some of your property into that, holding it as the trustee, is always more expensive uh, up front because as opposed to just setting up your bank account or leaving it just that way in your own name or having real estate that's just in your own name. Um, the, the, the advantage of it is that if you, if you own something in your own name, when you die, that property all goes through the probate process. And I, think I've, I don't think I've done a presentation here regarding probate. I know we did one up at Vineyard Haven last year. The probate process, if you've had to go through it, can be long and, time, and, and expensive. And you can avoid that probate process by holding your property in trust, in a trust in which you have complete control, but saying that following your death, a new trustee gets named, typically one of your kids, the person who would have been the executor of your will. And that successor trustee then has the ability, the moment that you die or the day after, to distribute all of this property right away without ever going through the probate process. Um, the other reason that people will, some folks would, would do this is that it just allows them, once again, just to keep more control of their property while they're alive. Because in the trust, you can specify in the event that you're incapacitated who's going to be the successor trustee. In the trust, you could name multiple successor trustees. If there's an argument, you can describe how the arguments get resolved. You can just be more detailed than you would if you were dealing with something with the power of attorney. So it's just an alternative that I just want you to be aware of. Next slide. Um, regarding trust, regarding, regarding the revocable trust, if you were creating such a thing, same as with the power of attorney, you want to figure out what the standard of incapacity is. You want to be able to say right in the trust document, if I'm no, what, what it is that would cause me to no longer be the trustee and to cause one of my kids to become the trustees. This is a really important thing because a lot of folks do these revocable trusts, and I recommend them to folks, uh, if, to avoid the probate process. But don't deal with what happens if they become incapacitated during their lifetimes. So if you own a piece of property and, and uh, as the trustee of a revocable trust, and you've said, following my death, I want my child to be the successor trustee and take care of everything. And then you get sick. Even if you've done a power of attorney, that would normally allow someone to deal for you regarding your property. If the property is held by you in trust, the power of attorney doesn't work because a trustee cannot give the power to act to somebody through a power of attorney. So if you're setting one of these things up, if you're setting up a revocable trust, you want to make sure that you're clear regarding how you figure out incapacity and how you figure out when the substitute trustee takes effect. You also want to specify when you can remove one of those trustees. So in the event that you've got a revocable trust, you're the trustee, for some reason somebody else has become the substitute, you want to keep control over being able to eliminate that substitute. And finally, one of the reasons why you do something like this is to make sure that the property is, that is in trust is going to get distributed the way you want it to get distributed following your death. Therefore, in the trust, you want to make sure it becomes irrevocable after your death so that if you've decided that you're the trustee of the trust and your house is in trust and your bank accounts are in trust and you've said following your death you want the property to be evenly divided among your, all of your children, you want to make sure that the trustee does not have the power after your death to change that in order to rearrange any of that money. So you just want to make sure that the thing becomes irrevocable after death. Next slide. Um, very quickly, just a word about wills. Out of state wills, um, we have these are just questions that I often get about wills, and so I, I put them into this presentation because people ask. And it's very common to get these questions in Martha's Vineyard. If you have an out-of-state will, it is enforceable in Massachusetts as long as it was valid in the state in which it was executed at the time it was executed. 
So that's the good news. The bad news is that if you, if you have a North Carolina will and you are living in Massachusetts and you die in Massachusetts, go to the probate court in Dukes County and try to explain to them what a valid North Carolina will looks like. Because that's what you have to tell, show. You have to show that the will was valid in North Carolina when it was executed. So for people who have moved here from out of state, what I always tell them is take your old will, go to an attorney, it's going to be very cheap, you go to an attorney, say, I want the same will, but I want to make sure it's a Massachusetts will, and they'll redo it for you. Same thing if you're leaving here, if you're moving to Florida. I always tell people, wherever you're living, that's, that's the state in which you want to have executed your will. So just take your old one, go to a local attorney, they'll just change it to make sure it looks like a Florida will, so that you're sure when you die that the, that the will's going to get properly probated and that it's not going to cost a lot of extra money. Um, pour over wills. What a poor, if you were doing one of these trusts, one of these revocable trusts or other kinds of trusts, then what you would typically do with your will is you would say, to the extent that I've left anything in my own name that I didn't put into trust, I'm going to pour that into the trust so that the, the, this property doesn't have to get, you don't have to spend a lot of time figuring out what to do with it in the probate process. But that's what that term means. Uh, do you need one? That's what you should really talk to an attorney about. Uh, next slide. This is always the goal. The reason why we talked about both the healthcare proxies and the powers of attorney was if you're worried about any of this stuff, the goal of the exercise is always to sleep well at night. And these two documents for a lot of folks in a lot of situations can really help you sleep better. Thank you very much. Any questions?